pequena ciência, queria só dizer olá a toda a gente em português e agora se não se importam vou passar em inglês, espero que todos precisem da tradução, se não tiverem ainda podem ir buscar lá fora uh, e vou passar a falar em inglês em, por respeito aos nossos convidados, ok? Uh, então, o tema do nosso, do nosso encontro hoje é microbiota e saúde uh, e, e como eu disse, oh sorry, um, so <laughs> I was just explaining that I was going to turn uh, into English and um, so today's topic is microbiota and, and human health and, uh, and uh, I'm from the Gulbenkian Science Institute in Oeiras which is part of the Gulbenkian Foundation where we are and, um, at the, and for those who don't know Uh, the, the Gulbenkian Institute is this building here in, in Oaira, is very close to, to, to the ocean. And at the Gulbenkian Institute, uh, we um, are interested in solving tomorrow's problems, tomorrow's challenges today. We want to be a lighthouse of collaborative, cross-disciplinary, cross-driven research and innovation um, in technology, uh, focusing in the, fo in the field of host microbiota interactions. Um, we, uh, we want to translate these co uh, this discoveries uh, for society towards promoting a healthy and sustainable uh, global future. The, the topic or the general topic of our research interest is very much related to the topic of today's uh, symposium and it's really thinking about the, mark, the, the organism as a whole and how the organism uh, as a whole interacts with its microbes and with the environment. So the reason why we are uh, joining a, a, you here today is that uh, during these two weeks we're, go we're having this uh, summer course for PhD students and we, ha we have this marvelous uh, uh, group of, of, um, of speakers Uh, uh, and which are teaching the students on the topic of host microbe symbiosis with all these uh, different uh, partnerships. And, and the organizers of this course, uh, 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 two of them will be talking to you today, Martin Blazer, Blazer from Rutgers University, M Margaret McFolney for, from Carnegie, Carnegie Institution, Uh, and, um, and these are the, are the other three organizers of the summer course. And today, uh, as it's announced in the program, you also have Michael Zimmermann from uh, the European Molecular Biology Lab from Germany. So the, the summer course and today's uh, symposium is sponsored by uh, this network called uh, SymbNet, which is related to symbiosis, which is how microbes interact uh, with their um, host uh, organisms. And, uh, and in this uh, uh, SymbNet, which is uh, sponsored by uh, a European grant, uh, we want to um, uh, start using more genomics and tablomics approach to study host microbial sim uh, symbiosis. As I said, it's a European network. Um, and uh, and it uh, it's, um, was implemented to promote uh, the research on this topic for uh, Gulbenkian Foundation and the ITKB Nova, which are two institutes located in the, in the Oeiras campus. Um, and we want to promote this uh, topic uh, in Portugal and also in the, in to, uh, at the international level. And uh, towards this aim, we are collaborating beyond the, um, the Gulbenkian Foundation with ITQB Nova, um, the University of Kiel, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Germany, and the University of Lausanne. And, um, and this SIMNET network is co uh, coordinated by my colleague uh, Luis Teixeira, which, um, which, who's very sorry not be able to hear, be here today, uh, but uh, we've um, been organizing these events together. So if you want to know more about this SIMNET network, we have a, a website that you can visit and, and we will uh, have, through next year, we'll have more events of this, of this kind and you can sign up uh, our newsletter to receive more information. So um, I don't want to take you much more time. Um, this is uh, today's symposium and, and um, 
and uh, we're going to start with the first speaker, which is Margaret McFall Nye uh, from the Car Carnegie Institution. And um, I'm going to give the stage to Margaret. I guess they will do something back there too. <laughs> So we'll start with Margaret and then, and then uh, uh, Martin Blazer and then Michael Zimmerman. And in the end, we'll have uh, time for discussion. But also, you can also ask a couple of questions in between the, the different talks, OK? Thank you, Karina. And good evening, everyone. Um, I am absolutely delighted and honored uh, for the opportunity to speak here to you t today. Um, in the beautiful city of Lisbon. You people are very lucky. <laughs> so um, what I'd like to do is I'm, I'm um, Marty Blazer and um, Michael, are gonna, Michael Zimmerman are going to speak after me, and they're going to tell you about the human microbiome. And what, I've, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of give you an idea of why we're here thinking about this now. This is a very interesting time um, in the field of biology and for human health. And so um, I'm going to give some sort of a 35,000 foot talk about, about the microbiome and, and why we're studying it now. So the field is in a revolution, and that's the field of biology and biomedicine. We're in a big, big revolution, and the impact of discovering is, is what we're what I'm going to be talking about is the impact of discovering this invisible force that we actually couldn't know before fairly recently, and that's the force of the Earth's microbiome. So there's a sea change, and what basically is happening is we're getting a much better understanding of life's diversity, and I'm going to tell you why that's happening and why that's happening now and um, the basis of this revolution and why it's really critical for us. And so I'd like you all to read this quote. So this quote, describes um, the position of physics, the field of physics, in the early 20th century. And so um, they were in a big revolution. And uh, this was the foreword to a book by Werner, Heisen, uh, a book by Werner Heisenberg, and um, talking about this advent of the golden age of physics. And I'm going to try to convince you that this is the golden age of biology. And um, at this point, what happened was, as a result of this, the physicist changed worldview, was radically and irreversibly altered. So what are revolution, what have been the revolutions in biology? So many of you are aware of the 19th century evolutionary biology and the modern, modern synthesis. That was a huge change in the way we saw the world. And it was amazing. Charles Darwin and Gregor Mendel gave him the mechanism of genetics um, to give us an idea of how it, how it would happen or how it worked. So this was the 19th century uh, biology revolution. The 20th century biology revolution was mediated by um, Rosalind Franklin, uh, James Watson, and Francis Crick. And this 20th century revolution was to show that DNA is the genetic material. And both of these things are going to be important for thinking about what comes next. But in both cases, this was a marriage of theory and mechanism. And so um, what are um, what is the 20th century revolution in biology all about, and how did we get there? And basically, what I'm going to tell you about is a phenomenal technological breakthrough that brought us to where we are. So let's think about how technological breakthroughs can, can change our view of who we are. So here we go. This is a really old one. And so this is the revolution that came in astronomy. So from 600 BC to about 1600, uh, humans, um, scholars, would talk about the Earth being the center of, of, our, of our solar system. So it was a geocentric view. 
Then Galileo came along with a telescope and proved that, in fact, it was a helio we are a heliocentric um, uh, uh, situation and with the sun in the center and all the planets radiating out from that. So heliocentrism now dominates um, from the 16th cent uh, 17th century to the present. So this one invention changed our view of the universe and it changed our view of our position in the universe. So where, where's the biology revolution I'm talking about? So imagine this, for over 2,000 years, way back to Aristotle, we classified the biological world on what we could see, either with the aided, unaided eye, in other words, with our eyes, with Aristotle it was animals and plants, or with, with microscopes. And so Anton van Leeuwenhoek, uh, back in the 17th century, built this small microscope. He took a cheek swab from the inside of his cheek and he put it on this, and he showed that he, he could see these little tiny things, which he called animicules. And so he had animals, plants, and animicules. Then this went on for a long time, and microscopes got better and better and better. And then there was a big change uh, with the electron microscope, and uh, a guy named Robert Whitaker uh, brought forth something called the Five Kingdom Model. And so by looking at the complexity of the cells and the things that made up animals, plants, fungi, and protists, these small things, these are single-celled things, by looking at their complexity under an electron microscope, what he did was he was able to say that there are these five kingdoms. So of those of you who have taken biology, how many of you learned the five kingdom model of the organization of the biosphere? Most of you did. Okay, I'm gonna change your mind, I hope. Okay. So, oops. So basically, like I said, this whole group right here, and I want you to keep your eye on this, the, the group in this green circle here, the eukaryota, and those are organisms that have a nucleus at their cell. Um, what happened was this guy here, Carl Woese at the University of Illinois, um, reasoned that to get a more accurate picture of our relatedness, we need to look at our DNA, we need to look at our genes, um, because um, it, we needed an entirely new method. It reflects, the genes reflect our relatedness. And so he reasoned that we should look at genes, and we began to be able to sequence genes, and that's what he did. So his idea was that the use of genetic sequences to determine rate relatedness was his method, and he, he reasoned that the more similar a sequence, a, a given fairly highly conserved sequence, the more similar they were, the more similar the organisms were that he got those sequences from. So, but, in, in his day and age, in the late 1970s, through the 1980s, through the 1990s, all the way to around 2008, and I'm gonna show you that, it was really slow and really expensive. So it went along really slowly. Here's the technological breakthrough in biology that happened. So it was something called next generation sequencing was invented, and we could now do this whole this thing that Carl Woese wanted to do Fast, quickly, it was fast and cheap. <laughs> it didn't cost much money. And so it was incredibly democratizing to the, to the field of biology. Everybody went out and started sequencing. So this, a wide frontier was opened. And so the cost of sequencing a million bases of DNA went from 5,000, about 5,000 euros, to about 0.01 euro. I mean, it just went really, really cheap. And so, and it continues to come down here. So 30 plus years after Carl Woese takes us to 2008. And so what's happened in the last 14 years is we've, um, we've get, we're beginning to know, like I said, a world we couldn't have known before. So what have we learned? What have we learned in those 14 years? Well, first of all, it's the biggest change in our view of the biosphere since Darwin. So Darwin 
and, and everything before them with the visual system was based on what had happened before. It sort of built on what had happened before. This is a whole new way of looking at, at the biosphere. And so it's the biggest change in our view since Darwin. And so, it, like I said, it was a world we couldn't know. And he, what had happened was this particular group that I mentioned to you, you should keep your eye on, is now known by sequencing and looking at all the sequences of a whole bunch of microbes. These guys make up a very, very small proportion of the diversity of life, a very small proportion. And most of these are all microbial. This is all microbes. So the diversity of the biosphere of life is overwhelmingly, has been historically, and continues to be overwhelmingly microbial. So microbes are super, one of the other things that we learned is that they're super, super abundant. And so what I'm showing here is I'm showing the aquatic environment. There are a million bacteria per square centimeter of ocean or per milliliter. There are a million bacteria. So when you swim in the ocean, think about the fact that you're swimming through a million and it's, and it's 10 to the 12th per meter cubed. So there are that many in a meter cubed, 10 to the 12th bacteria. Um, and then on land, the land isn't so supportive, the air isn't so supportive of microorganisms. So um, there are fewer, um, and there, there are about a million per meter squared instead of 10 to the 12th, there are 10 to the 6th. Um, and on the land, in, in the ocean, they're really active and alive, and probably many of them are dead in, in this area. The soil is super rich. There are about 10 to, 10 to the 16th per meter cubed um, in the soil. So bacteria are really abundant. It is estimated by the astronomers that there are 10 to the 24th stars in the sky. Okay? And it is estimated by the microbiologists of the world that there are 10 to the 28th microbes on Earth. So there are significantly more microbes on Earth than there are stars in the sky. So basically, what this has done, um, Copernicus was actually the guy who thought of the idea, and then after 60 years, Galileo invented the, micro the uh, telescope, and it changed our view of our position in the universe. And, our, um, and then in biology, Carl Woese uh, thought up the idea, and then 30 years later, next-gen sequencing was invented. This invention of Carl Woese changed our view of the biosphere, Carl Woese with next-gen sequencing, and our view of our position in the biosphere. So this was a huge change. So the activities of microbes um, appear, with all of the data that we've gathered, appear to to drive the form and function of animals and plants and other things in the biosphere. And they are pivotal for the health of the soil, for your body's health, and, and um, Marty and Michael are gonna talk about this. Um, they're, for the health of the water, everything is reliant on, on a healthy balance of the microbial world in those regions. So the impact of this phenomenal diversity or this new knowledge and ecological implications of this diversity are at this continuing to shape the field of biology and will for decades to come. It's a very big change in the way biologists view the world. So let me give you a few examples of how this is happening. So first of all, um, let me tell you what I did here. There's something called European PMC, and this is the scientists, how many uh, references the scientists have put out in this field, in this particular field. And so what I did was, um, you can search, you have a search engine, and you search the word microbiome, which tells you about the microbes, and, and you put in the word soil, or you put in the word brain, or plant, or ecology, and you ask how, much, how many um, references are there that are out there. Um, and here it is, there are 17,000, 24,000 and so on, but the really remarkable thing is this is most of these, in most cases except ecology, most of these have, ha have, have been written in the last three years. That's just to show you how quickly moving this field is. 
Now this is another search engine, and this search engine is PubMed in the United States, and I did the same set of words. And this shows you that trajectory, and this arrow down here on each of this, these is 2008. And so this shows you how quickly this field is moving and how much we're learning from this stuff. So let me go into one specific one a little bit more deeply, and that's cancer. So um, here's the microbiome in cancer, and there is now a to total of 37,000, with 52% um, uh, of those being in the last three years. And you can see this, this is 2008. And I can tell you guys that I was asked to open a meeting at the National Cancer Institute in, in uh, the United States. And um, it was because the, they invited me back to talk to them about the evolution of the biosphere and microbes because the cancer um, biomedical community is just shocked. And here's why they're shocked. Um, every tumor, every cancerous tumor in your body has a specific microbiome. And this, is a, this was a review article, and any of you who are interested, these are the, these are the uh, references. And this is Rob Knight, who's um, uh, just a, a genius, and he is, um, he's really an important player in this area. But so a breast cancer tumor of one woman is very similar in diversity and content to a breast cancer tumor in, in another woman. Um, and so my point is that each different kind of tumor has a diversity associated with it and a, in, a in a set of microbes associated with it. It's interesting because they've always talked about how the immune system is involved in cancer. Now are we surprised? There are microbes in there. <laughs> okay, so the phenomenon of the microbial integration occurs at the level of the in individual. And that is to say, that we, we used to, in biology, we would model things and we would look at things like that's a tree and that's a human and, and so on. But actually, it, um, these, these organisms occur as nested ecosystems. And so we've got microbes along all many surfaces of our body. So in our case, the healthy human is a nested ecosystem. And this shows the diversity. And so there are about 10 to the 13th to 10 to the 14th microbes that live in and on us. So look at the person next to you <laughs> and recognize that, um, that the genes represented, the unique genes represented, are only 1% human. So most of the genes in your body um, are from the abundant microbes that, that are colonizing just about every surface. So there, this is a formidable change to our field, a tremendous change, and we're, we're learning very quickly. Um, it, but integrating this um, is, is critical, but um, it's hard. And why is the integration so difficult? Why are biologists struggling with beginning to think about this? And so what happened at this revolution was biology as a field went into deep silos, and people were, became ecologists or trained to become organismal biologists or cell biologists or molecular biologists. And so somebody could get a degree in biology working on an organism and not even know very much about that organism because they would be doing molecular biology. And so um, this, is, this is, was, a, um, uh, a, is, is a, was a truism. And that, that siloing in biology is reflected in the structures of departments and the institutes, and in, in the United States, at least, in the funding agencies and how they're structured. So shaping our change, we, we you know, the goals that I think that the field has in general um, are very lofty goals. They're really, you know, big changes. And what we have to do is we have to integrate micro and macrobiology. You can take, at least in the United States, you can call yourself a biologist getting a bachelor's degree in biological sciences with a single lecture in the microbial world. So it's, it, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> you just can't do that anymore. But that is the case. So um, if, if we did this into a unifying biology uh, conceptual framework, it would allow us um, to know what's critical for life processes. And I think that's, some, that's, a, that's a big goal, is to, is to sort of get everything more holistic and, you know, 
more, and then engage physical scientists and mathematicians. These different science groups haven't been very um, inter interactive, and I think that's another goal that we have to have. So pushing this revolution is highly critical, and it's because we're in a climate crisis. And I strongly believe that if you can't, you can't be effective and creative with solutions to things like climate change if you do not have an accurate conceptual framework for the structure and function of the biological world. So here, uh, Karina introduced SimNet, and um, this uh, IGC is becoming an international leader in this area. And it's very exciting um, for, um, for me to have an opportunity to come and participate in sim the symbio summer symbiosis course and to have an opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? No? Okay, if, okay. There, if there's no questions now, we, we'll have a discussion in the end. So then, uh, uh, Michael, can you? Uh, sorry, Marty. <laughs> Martin. Also. Yeah. <coughs> a, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Karina. Thank you for the invitation uh, to be here. And it's actually a, also always a great pleasure to follow Margaret, who, who sets the stage for us. And uh, I think you'll see where the work that I'm going to discuss and Michael will discuss will, will fit in. So let's begin. Yes, yeah, so the title of my talk is The Double-Edged Sword of Antibiotics. And I hope y you will see what I mean. So I begin with this, these maps of Greenland from, from space in 1992 and 2002. And you can see that there's been a big change. There's a lot less ice. And if we think about what caused this, we know that this is caused by global warming. And we can think of global warming as a change in our macroecology uh, that is, is an ongoing crisis. And what I'm going to discuss today is a change in our microecology, which I would submit is of similar magnitude. So the question that, that uh, frames this is why have so many diseases increased in recent decades? And here we look at three different diseases, uh, diseases of the esophagus, like reflux, esophagitis, by the way, I'm a medical doctor, uh, or juvenile diabetes, which is doubling every 20 or 25 years, or asthma, which has gone up dramatically since World War II. And to that, we could add obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, food allergies, and neurodevelopmental problems as well. So if 10 diseases are going up more or less at the same time, do they have 10 different causes? Or perhaps there's one cause that underlies them all. And that's what I'd like to discuss today. I want to also add, let's say, the 11th disease, and that's obesity. And this slide looks at proportion of adults who are obese in Europe by country from 1975 to 2016. And you can see which way the lines are going. And here's Portugal, uh, so somewhere in the middle. Portugal is no different from the other countries. And to get another view uh, from the World Health Organization uh, repository, uh, we can see that, uh, that the, the rate of, uh, of people who are overweight in men and women and obese are actually very high numbers across the society. So how did we get there? And furthermore, if we look at children, uh, these, are, these are the future adults, and uh, this is a map of the proportion of children from two to four who were overweight in 2016. And I'm sorry to say that the Iberia, Spain and Portugal, are among the, the darkest colors. There's actually 
in southern Europe, uh, it, the problem is worse in general than in northern Europe. So this is, this, is, this is a big problem, and unfortunately, it's getting worse. So how can we explain it? Well, I go back to the same slide uh, that Margaret showed. Uh, this, is, this is a view, th this could be called a microbiologist view of the human body. Human cells, about 10 to the 13th. Microbial cells, 10 to the 14th. It raises the philosophical question of who are we? Here's a geneticist view of the human body. Human genes, 23,000. Microbial genes, on average, about 2 million. So what, what are all these genes doing? And as Margaret said, most of the genes in the human body are microbial. Now, where do we get all these microbes? Well, it turns out that mothers are important. As in other animals, there is a big transfer of microbes from mother to child at the time, around the time of birth. We humans are mammals. We're born in a womb that is sterile, or mostly sterile. Our first big exposure to microbes happens when the water breaks, and the baby descends through the birth canal and is covered by the mom's microbes. The baby swallows the microbes. There's skin-to-skin -skin contact of baby and mother. The baby's mouth full of microbes inoculates the breast, and now microbes and food go in. This is the foundation of the microbiome of the GI tract. And mothers are kissing babies and licking babies and pre-chewing food, lots of redundant ways to transfer the microbiome from one generation to the other. And that's how it always has been. But now, mothers are different than they used to be. They live in a world of antisepsis, of antibiotics, of antibacterials in their diet. And babies are different, too. They may be born by cesarean section. They may miss the ride through the birth canal. In many countries, one baby out of three is born by C-section. In some countries, one baby in two. Babies are bathed extensively. They're given formula, which only superficially resembles human breast milk without the micronutrients. And they get lots of medications, especially antibiotics, which I'll be talking about. So on this basis, over the last 25 years, I've been developing an idea that I call the theory of the disappearing microbiota. This theory has two major tenets. The first is that changed human ecology has altered the transmission and maintenance of ancestral microbes, which affects the composition of the microbiota. And the second is that the microbes, both good and bad, usually acquired early in life, are especially important, since they affect a developmentally critical stage. About 10 years ago, Dr. Stan Falco and I enlarged this hypothesis it's shown here the effect of maternal status on the resident microbiota of the next generation. Our view was that ancient moms would carry an ancient microbiota, and they would give them to the next generation. But if they lost microbes and could not get them back horizontally from other people, then that next generation would be born at a deficit, and so on and so forth. And in this model, the change in the microbiota over time has been cumulative. This would describe what we believe has been going on in the 20th century and now into the 21st century. And unfortunately, there's more and more data that confirm this model. So what could be causing this? Well, I'm going to focus on antibiotics. All of us grew up in the antibiotic era. We know antibiotics is one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. They entered the practice of medicine in the late 1940s. They've saved innumerable lives. They've revolutionized every aspect of medicine. But as a result, health practitioners use antibiotics more and more and more. How much more? Here are some statistics on the scale of antibiotic exposures. Recent estimates, 73 billion antibiotic doses worldwide yearly. That's more than 10 antibiotic pills for every man, woman, and child on Earth. And the numbers are going up. In the United States, by the time children are two, they've had, on average, almost three courses of antibiotics. By the time they're 10, about 10 courses of antibiotics. And pregnant women, just before the handoff, uh, they are, about 50% of them are treated or exposed to antibiotics through treatment or prophylaxis. And there's also exposure from antibiotic use on the farm. We don't even know the magnitude of that. Now, here's. But wherever we look at antibiotics, we see tremendous variation in antibiotic use. So here's variation in per capita antibiotic prescribing in 31 European countries, ranging from the Netherlands to Greece, 
more than a threefold variation in antibiotic dosing per capita. There is not a threefold variation in serious bacterial infection. This reflects the practice of medicine, the culture of medicine. Here's Portugal, about in the middle of Europe. So the question is, does this have anything to do with disease? And I'm next going to examine the question whether exposure is correlated with subsequent disease risk. And for that, I'll tell you about a study that we did with colleagues at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. We studied all the children born in Olmsted County, which is where the Mayo Clinic is located. We, were, we divided these children into a period of antibiotic exposure up to the age of two and then a period of health outcomes from 2 to 13. In total, we studied 14,000 children. 10,000 received antibiotics in the first two years of life. 4,000 did not. They received the typical antibiotics that children in the United States get. Here's the result for an analysis of the time to developing asthma by sex and antibiotic exposure. The x-axis is starting at the age of 2 to 14. The y-axis is the probability of asthma. The red lines are girls, the blue lines are boys. The solid red line are girls who did not have antibiotics in the first two years of life, and here are girls who did. Here are boys, no antibiotics, boys who did, about doubling the rate that they developed asthma. In fact, we looked at 10 common health conditions in this study, including allergic and inflammatory conditions, metabolic conditions, and neurodevelopmental conditions. And here is a hazard ratio. A hazard ratio of 1 is neutral. All 10 conditions, the hazard ratio is greater than 1. And 8 of the 10, the differences are statistically significant. Um, this, we also found associations with the number of antibiotic courses, the timing of exposure, and the antibiotic classes. And in another more recent study, we have confirmed these findings. So this is correlation. These are observational studies. This correlation, people take antibiotics for many purposes. So the question is, is there a causal relationship? Do early life exposures increase susceptibility to disease? And we begin to answer this question by considering the farm. Because 70 years ago, farmers discovered that if they fed antibiotics to their livestock, they would gain weight more rapidly. Antibiotics have been used in farm animals to promote their growth. It's called growth promotion. It works from chickens to cows, a wide swath of vertebrate evolution. It works with antibacterials, regardless of their chemical structure, class, target, or spectrum. It does not work with antifungals or antivirals. Very importantly, the earlier in life the antibiotics are started, the bigger the effect on growth rate and on feed efficiency, the conversion of calories in food into body mass. So we began to do studies in mice, where we would give mice antibiotics or not, examine properties, look at the microbiome, look for a relationship. We've now done about 50 studies. I'm going to show you five. The first studies were done by Dr. Il-Sung Cho when he was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. Il-Sung gave mice four different antibiotic regimens at the midpoint of the dose approved by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States or no antibiotics. And here we're looking at percent body fat. And the mice that received the antibiotics have more fat than the mice that didn't. And you can see it in this picture. This was our first evidence that antibiotics were changing metabolism in mice. This work was continued by Dr. Lori Cox when she was a graduate student in the lab. Lori asked, what's the effect of, con of uh, combining a diet rich in calories with antibiotics? So, uh, she gave mice, uh, the mice were exposed to low-dose penicillin or not. They were all on normal diet, and then at week 17 of life, half the mice went on a high-fat diet. Here are some of the major results. We studied male and female mice, total mass, fat mass, and lean mass. If we start with the male mice, the total mass here, this is the control group. On antibiotics, they're bigger. On the high-fat diet, bigger still. High fat plus antibiotics, big S. Muscle mass increased on antibiotics, just like on the farm. Fat mass, big increase on the high fat diet, even bigger, high fat plus antibiotics. Similar finding in females. If we look at fat mass, the average female mouse on the high fat diet, five grams of body fat, 
High fat plus antibiotics, 10 grams. It doubled. The antibiotic potentiated the effect of the high fat diet. In another study, we looked at the effect of, uh, of antibiotics in a, a model of mice for the development of type 1 diabetes. Shu Song Zhang gave mice three different courses of antibiotics, or not, and tracked diabetes, or he only gave a single course, or not, and tracked diabetes. Here's the analysis of the incidence of type 1 diabetes. The blue lines are the control mice. They're developing diabetes as we expect for this breed of mouse. But the mice that got antibiotics got diabetes earlier and more. And even a single course was sufficient for the full effect. Now, another problem we were interested in was inflammatory bowel disease, which is going up all over the world. This is a study from Denmark looking at all the children born in Denmark and asking what's the likelihood of IBD developing in Danish children according to how many courses of antibiotics they received in the first year of life. And the bottom line was the more courses, the more likely they were to develop IBD. So we decided to study this in a mouse model also to look at causal relationships. And in this study, we asked, can an antibiotic altered microbiota affect IBD outcome? And to make it more interesting, we looked at the next generation. So we looked at wild-type mice and mice uh, that were knockout mice. They, they were specific. Uh, and they, these are mice that spontaneously develop colitis. So this study was done by Angel Schulfer when she was a graduate student in the lab. Angel gave either normal microbiota or antibiotic perturbed microbiota to mice that were germ-free. They were living in a bubble. They had no microbiota. She now gave them microbiota. She had two genotypes of mice, two inocula, four groups of mice. These mice were pregnant, so they soon gave birth to their pups, and now we followed their pups until they were middle-aged, 21 weeks old. We wanted to know what was the effect of this perturbed microbiota on the ecology of the gut, and what were the effects on the disease. There were many effects on the ecology of the gut, and you can read it in the paper, but I'm going to tell you about disease. So here's colonic pathology in the IL-10 knockout pups at week 21 according to the microbiota to which their mothers were exposed. So here's the colon of a, a mouse whose mother got the normal microbiota. This mouse has colitis. We expect that in an IL-10 pup. But the pup whose mother got the perturbed microbiota, they have a huge amount of inflammation. And in fact, this difference is 30-fold. Let me summarize the key points of this experiment and remind you that neither the pups nor the mother received antibiotics in this experiment. That means that the enhanced disease signal that we're seeing is entirely microbial. That means that antibiotic effects can cross generations. And it also means that inheritance is also based on microbes and their genes. So to summarize what I've said so far, antibiotics have long-term effects on metabolism and immunity. The effects are due to perturbing the microbiome. Other factors of modern life also contribute, but I haven't discussed now. The effects may be transmitted to the next generation, and we need to find and implement solutions. So this is a pretty bleak story. How, how about some, something more positive? Well, in order to solve this problem, first we're going to have to curtail unnecessary antibiotic use, and then we're going to have to figure out ways to restore the microbiome that has been disappearing. We have been working on this in several ways, and I want to show you an experiment that Xu Song Zhang has done, going back to the model in the, uh, of type 1 diabetes development with the NOD mice. Now he had three groups of mice, control mice, no antibiotics, antibiotics, or antibiotics followed by a transplant of intestinal materials, cecal materials from mothers, and he followed their rate of developing dia diabetes. Here's the analysis of the rate of diabetes. Here are the control mice getting diabetes as we expected, the mice with antibiotics getting more as we expected, and now the group that got antibiotics but got the mom poop, they, they are intermediate. We have almost completely restored them. So this is a proof of principle that restoration is possible. We have many findings from this experiment. I'm going to just show you one last result. And here we're looking at gene expression in the intestine of these recipient mice in relation to the restoration. Each column is one mouse. 
Each row is one gene. This is a heat map. Red is on, blue is off. So, and this is what's called an unsupervised hierarchical clustering. So what we find is that the mice that received antibiotics, they cluster by themselves. The mice that were the controls, no antibiotics, they cluster. But the mice that received antibiotics and got the mom poop, they're clustering with the controls. There are very specific genes that have converted from the antibiotic pattern to the control pattern in both directions. We know what all these genes are. So this, in addition to being a proof of principle, is a pathway for discovery of microbes, microbial genes, metabolites, and host genes that are perturbed by antibiotics that drive autoimmunity and that can be restored. So this is a view of diversity loss in the microbiome in three model locales. This might be a country like the US or Portugal. We began to develop early. We're in, let's say, the seventh generation of development. This might, the red line might be India or China that started to develop late, but is catching up in a hurry. Yellow might be a country in Africa or Latin America just starting to develop. This was our view in 2016. And the question is, what's the future going to bring? Is the microbiome going to decline further? Are we going to be able to arrest the decline? Or are we going to be able to reverse it through restorative steps? And if we want to restore it. What's the medicine of the future going to look like? My, uh, my projection is that the doctors of the future will examine newborn babies, and they'll examine their diaper. And they'll ask, does this baby have the global microbes and the personal microbes that such a baby should have? And if they don't have it, they will administer those microbes that will be developed by science to give to these babies, and they will examine over time and reshape the microbiome as needed to optimize their health. So if microbes are disappearing, where will they get them from? Uh, a, a, a new endeavor has started, the Microbiota Vault, led by Maria Gloria Dominguez. It's a global nonprofit effort to conserve long-term health for humanity. We want to store the microbes from around the world so that they will be available for future generations. You can read about it in Science or at our website. Recently, a film has been made about these concepts. It's not available yet, but we hope it will be available soon. And many people helped with the work I've shown today. I've tried to indicate them, and there were many colleagues and, and many different funding agencies. Thank you for your attention. And I, I'm happy to answer any questions. It seems that they prefer. I hope you're saving all your questions for the discussion in the end, right? <laughs> Think about the questions that you might be interested in, in discussing. So now we'll have Michael Zimmerman from the MBL. Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks a lot, Karina, and uh, to the Glubenkin uh, Foundation for the invitation. It's, it's a huge honor uh, to be here and um, to speak after Margaret and Marty um, honors me tremendously. Um, we jump right away in with um, a graphics that you have seen before, if the pointer will work. Yeah, the, the mover actually, the slide. OK, I see a timeout. Yep, now it works. So you have seen that before, after all the tension was built up. Um, so you've seen that before, that we are all in this room only 1% human and about 99% microbial when we look at our genes. I want to also emphasize another aspect um, with a similar graph that it's not only that we have a lot of microbes and microbial genes in our body, but in comparison to our human genome, our microbiotas or microbiomes can actually be tremendously different. So whereas humans are fairly similar despite we have apparent differences, our microbiota is, can really be very diverse, up to 80% different from person to person. So 
many researchers over the last years, and Margaret has actually nicely illustrated how we got there through sequencing, have asked the question, what led to those differences? And I really show here just a cartoon illustration what people have found. Obviously, diet makes a huge difference on your microbiome, in particular the gut microbiota. Your lifestyle, whether you exercise, your sleep habits, but also with whom you live, your family, your pets, Traveling, most of us have probably experienced when you travel, sometimes you have um, some digestive issues. Um, that is an impact on the microbiota that you might feel. Diseases and medical intervention, um, Martin has, has nicely illustrated that, how disease can actually be caused by the microbiota, but also disease can affect the microbiota. And also, Martin explained um, how antibiotics have an impact on the bacteria um, in, in, on our body. And I want to show um, um, a few studies um, showing how medication that are not per se antibiotics can also have an impact. So here is a study that dates back that was performed um, by Per Borg and, and his team. They looked at the diabetes type 2, uh, so not type 1, but type 2, where each of those dots is actually an individual. And you have in green, you have the healthy controls. In red, um, in red, you have people who were treated with metformin, which is um, um, a, a drug used to treat a diabetes 2. And then in yellow, you have um, um, patients who were not treated with metformin. And what they asked is how close do those people's microbiota um, uh, locate to each other um, in this graph? And they looked how well disease would separate differences between the patients, and how would the intake of drugs separate? And I don't want to go too much into details, but you can appreciate that from the green healthy people, um, the, the, the patients that got metformin are actually most separated. And they concluded from this study that metformin intake has a higher impact on the diversity of the microbiota than the disease itself. That's, of course, just a correlational study, and people wanted to explain mechanistically how could they, uh, how, how do those non-antibiotics potentially impact the composition of the microbiota? And this is a study that was performed by Nassas Tipas, a colleague of, of mine at, at EMBL, who, who um, wanted to grow bacteria, and he wanted to see whether exposing bacteria from the human gut to non-antibiotics and to antibiotics, how actually those bacteria get inhibited and get an impact on growth. And I show here um, um, schem a schematic of an anaerobic um, bubble that's like a greenhouse that doesn't have oxygen because our intestine is mostly anaerobic. So if you want to grow this bacteria, you have to make sure that there's no oxygen in there. So that's what they did. They took bacteria from the human intestine, 40 different isolates, and then they took drugs and tested whether throwing drugs on those bacteria cultures would inhibit growth of those bacteria. And you can just here see schematically um, such growth curves where on the y-axis you see when the bacteria grows, it goes up, and then uh, over time. And you can see if you add antibiotics here in, in red and in green a higher dose, you see that they grow worse. So the bacteria, the, the antibiotics has an impact on bacterial growth. And Nassos and his team, he hasn't done that one by one. He took 40 different bacteria and more than a thousand drugs, and he tested that using some robotics to assess which drugs have an impact on which bacteria fitness. You can see here a heat map where you see again the 40 different representative strains they tested. You see the thousand drugs and they, are, they group them in antibacterial drugs, which are um, about 250. And you can see whenever um, a drug had an impact on the fitness of a bacteria, they would color that square. And you can see, as also expected from Martin's talk before, that a lot of antibiotics also inhibit normal gut bacteria that are not the pathogens that the doctor wants to treat, but actually our commensal with whom we live and who help us to be healthy. 
What they show here on, uh, in red is actually 800 non-antibiotic drugs. So these are drugs that were not designed to be antibiotics. And you can see there's a lot of red squares, and when they quantified it, they found that 25% or a quarter of the non-antibiotic drugs had an impact, an antibiotic impact on uh, bacteria of our intestine. So to, to summarize this first part, I wanted to show you once more, being the third person, that we have about 100 times more genes that are encoded by the bacteria um, that live in our body compared to our own human genome. I wanted to um, emphasize that there's a large interpersonal difference or variation in the composition of the gut microbiota. And among other factor, factors, antibiotics and non-antibiotics as well are actually um, responsible for changes of the gut microbiota composition. Now I want to switch gears a little bit for my second part, and I want to show you this illustration, because when we think of drug, we typically don't think of the microbiota. But what we often, or at least doctors think a lot about is when we have patients with the same disease and we give them exactly the same drug, individuals' response to that drug can vary dramatically. So you can have patients, shown here in green, that just have beneficial effects and no side effects. That's where we want to be. However, there are also patients here depicted in blue that might not even feel that they have taken a drug. And then we have patients that are shown here in yellow and red that might show different degrees of side effects. The problem is that we do not know a priori to which group a given patient belongs to when they enter clinics, which makes it challenging to find the right drug for the right patient in the right dose. So I show you again this picture. So when you just compare 23,000 human genes versus 2 million microbial genes, raises the question, well, do those 2 million, do they, do they play a role? So the question we ask is, does the gut microbiota contribute to those interpersonal um, differences in drug metabolism? And do they, can they contribute um, to drug metabolism and drug response? And I show here a mouse just to make sure that we all, um, we all walk through the path of an oral drug. So if we take an oral drug or a mouse is given an oral drug, the drug is typically absorbed in the small intestine, reaches circulation, has hopefully only a beneficial effect until it's metabolized and eventually secreted from the system. However, drugs are typically not fully absorbed and a certain portion further propagates in the intestine, where it sees increasing numbers of microbes, which might also have the capacity with their uh, collection of two million genes to convert the drug into a metabolite that can be taken up and have an effect on the system. So to study this system a little bit better, we looked at this drug called Brividine, which is an antiviral drug used um, to treat um, herpes virus. Because this drug is metabolized in the body to bromovenyluracil, or short BVU, which is a toxic metabolite, as it inhibits in the liver an enzyme called DPD, which is responsible for the metabolism of an anti-cancer drug, 5-FU or 5-fluorouracil. And before this interaction was recognized, um, 18 people, 18 patients died in clinics so what we first wanted to do, we wanted to ask the question, well, can both host enzymes and microbial enzymes convert this drug to its toxic metabolite? And what we did is we took gut content from mouse and human, that's basically we took poop and, and cultured it in this anaerobic tent, and we took liver from both, from human and um, mouse, we homogenized it, and then we incubated to all of those preparations Brividine, and we followed the conversion to BVU. And as you can see in this plot, it, the drug on the upper row goes down in all the graphs, but then the metabolite comes up, suggesting that indeed both microbial enzymes and host enzymes can convert the drug into its toxic metabolite. This is all in vitro, but we wanted to know, well, does this even matter? 
in vivo that bacteria can metabolize the drug. And to do this, so we actually went to the mouse model that uh, Martin has introduced before, so-called germ-free mice. Here is what those bubbles that he mentioned look like. In those bubbles, we have mice that are completely sterile. They don't have a single microbe in, 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 um, in or on their body. And we took those mice and we gave these mice, germ-free shown here in red, and conventional mice that have a normal microbiome, an oral dose of brevodine. And then we looked in the um, intestine whether the drug is there or whether it's metabolized. And as you can appreciate from those plots where you have the amount of drug and drug metabolite in the lower row, and you have the time axis from zero to nine hours in the x-axis, you can see that only in the germ-free animals where we don't have a microbiome, we have large levels or high levels of the drugs, whereas in conventional animals with a microbiome, the drug is completely metabolized away. Interestingly, we didn't find a courting accumulation of the toxic metabolite in those same, in those same body compartments in the gut, suggesting that perhaps it is taken up from the intestine, and indeed, that's what we saw when we looked at serum, at blood of those animals. We found that only in conventional animals there was this huge accumulation of the toxic metabolite. So we concluded from that that the microbiota contributes to systemic BVUs, a BVU in the blood. And we asked the question, can we quantify that? And we did that with help of, of mathematicians um, to um, formulate the transition of the drug into drug metabolites and its distribution into the body. It's a, a so-called pharmacokinetic model, which allowed us to quantify that 70% of the toxic metabolite in blood is directly produced by the microbes in our intestine. So to summarize this part, I wanted to show you how we can experimentally dissect host and microbial metabolism of drugs, uh, how we then apply mathematical models to put a number on it and to quantify how much is really the are the bacteria responsible for the effect we see in vivo. And most importantly, I wanted to show you that there are cases in which the microbiome drug metabolism matters for drug kinetics and for toxicity. Well, we haven't yet answered um, the question, does the microbiota, um, is the microbiota responsible for some of the interpersonal differences we see? And that's what we wanted to ask next. We took 28 human volunteers, we took their intestinal content, and we grew it again in this anaerobic bubble. And then we incubated it with a drug to see how this drug is metabolized by the microbiota of, of those different persons. And I show you here directly the results. This is the production of, um, of the metabolite, the drug metabolite, and each line uh, represents um, or depicts a different human donor. And you have here in black the negative control where there's no bacteria in, um, um, incubated. So that's just a media control. And you can clearly see that we could group um, those um, people's microbiota in fast metabolizing microbiota, intermediate metabolizing microbiota, and slow metabolizing microbiota for this particular drug. Well, how can we now explain that? That's an observation. How can we explain those differences in community metabolism? And to do that, we chose a bottom-up approach, very similar to the approach that I showed that Nasas Tipas and his team has um, chosen to test the effect of drugs on growth of bacteria. In our case, we took 76 different bacterial representatives from the human gut, and we incubated it not only with one drug, we took 271 drugs, and we incubated those under anaerobic conditions to mimic the intestine, and then we used a machine, so-called mass spectrometer, which allows us to measure whether a drug gets metabolized by a given bacteria or not. Strikingly, we found that two-thirds, two out of three of the drugs that we tested was metabolized by at least one of the bacteria we tested. And you can see those uh, results in this heat map where you have on the y-axis the 76 different gut isolates that we tested. And in the x-axis, you see the 176 drugs that we found to be metabolized by at least one of the bacteria we tested.
If we then uh, look, take a closer look at the bacteria that were metabolized, uh, the bacteria that were metabolizing, we actually found that they group fairly nicely according to their relationship, telling us that bacteria that are more closely related, and Margaret showed you phylogenetic trees based on genetics, it's the same principle here, we found that actually their drug metabolic capacity is related to how closely related their genome is. If we then do the same type of analysis for the chemicals, we found that chemicals that share chemical features also cluster together. And I'll show you here one example of five drugs that are specifically metabolized by the red bacteria. And all of those bacteria share a so-called ester group, which is highlighted here in red, suggesting that the bacteria would actually metabolize that. We then wanted to know whether what they really do chemically, and to do that, um, we went back to our samples, and you can um, not only look at your drug, but we can also look at your drug metabolites, allowing us to find out what is the transformation product the bacteria produce. And this allowed us to, to, um, to, to group the, the different drugs according to their chemical modification, which you see here in this histogram, where each bar is actually a chemical modification, done by the bacteria, and the higher the bar, the more drugs actually follow that chemical modification. So what we concluded from that is that indeed, multiple drugs undergo the same chemical modification. So now we wanted to know, can we actually figure out who is responsible? What is the gene that is responsible? Out of those two million genes that we have in our microbiota, can we depict the one that is responsible for a given drug metabolism? And to do that, you've already seen that library, but here instead of testing different bacterial strains, we test actually individual genes coming from the bacteria. And this allows us to directly go back to the genome and um, identify the enzymes, which are um, the, the proteins that uh, um, convert, kind of the scissors that chop off um, the drugs. Um, and I show you here one example for diltiazine, which is a calcium channel blocker uh, that, for which we find the gene, which I show here in the next plot, which we then test biochemically, that gets converted into its metabolite. And you might have noticed that's exactly the drug I showed you at the very beginning. We then also go into the bacteria. This is a gut bacterium, um, Bacteroidetes tetiota omicron, a common gut bacteria in human, which metabolizes the drug and converts it to diltiazine. So the same plot that I showed you for the first drug. And what we did, we actually took molecular scissors and we cut out the gene that is responsible for the metabolism of this, of this drug, which I show you here here in black. So when we cut out that gene, it loses a lot of its capability to metabolize the drug. And what we then do to do to show proof, we take that gene and we actually bring it back into the genome of this bacteria, which you can see here in this dotted line. So the bacteria regains the capacity to metabolize deltiazine. Having now two different bacterial strains in our hands that differ by one single gene and their capacity to metabolize the drug allows us to go back to the mouse model. And we use those um, bubble mice and we colonize them either with wild type bacteria or with bacteria that lack that single gene being responsible for drug metabolism. And then we do pharmacokinetics, as I showed for brevodine. And what we found is that single bacterial gene, when we knock it out, we have higher levels of the drug, shown here in green, but lower levels of the drug metabolite compared to uh, mice that we colonized with wild-type bacteria, demonstrating that that single bacterial gene that we identified has an impact on the drug response and kinetics in these animals. So now the last, the really key question with which I started, can metabolic genes in bacteria actually explain interpersonal differences in microbiota drug metabolism? 
So we've already seen this data, that's how I started this third part, where we see 28 human gut communities that we grew in the laboratory and we tested for their capacity to convert diltiazine to its metabolite. And you see here all the 28 lines where each line again shows the production of the drug metabolite by the gut bacteria. But what we now had after um, having performed that, um, those experiments shown before is we had a gene which is responsible for the transfer. And when we quantify the abundance of that gene in all 28 communities, and we plot that against the activity of the community, we actually find a fairly good linear correlation between the abundance of the gene in the community with each about two million different genes and the activity of the community, suggesting that that gene fairly well explains the, the differences, those interpersonal differences in um, drug metabolism by the gut microbiota. To summarize this third part, I wanted to show you how experimental approaches in the laboratory can be used to, um, to investigate those bacteria um, drug interactions and how we can systematically identify microbe derived drug metabolites and the responsible genes. And that once we have those genes in our hands, we can actually go back to the community and ask the question, do those genes explain and potentially in the future predict um, interpersonal differences in drug metabolism? And with this, I want to summarize, summarize with, with this cartoon um, that we really start to think about how gut bacteria change medical drugs that's the axis where the microbiome impact drugs, but also how they get drugged themselves by antibiotics and also by other drugs and change our microbiota, which in fact then also has an impact. There's a mutual impact um, of those two effects. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and happy to take questions. So maybe we all, all we all go to the stage now. Dead bug. Um, okay, so um, I hope I hope you enjoyed the the, the three talks today, and and and, um, and and I'm we are open for questions, curiosities, doubts. <laughs> there's one question here. Uh, there's a microphone. So you can start, right? No, it's Martha. Hi, thank you. It was super nice, really enlightening. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm full of ideas of things to think about. Um, I wanted to ask, you have showed a lot of data on how antibiotics affect the growth in farms. And do we know exactly why that happens? So the question is, how do, how do, when farmers give antibiotics to farm animals, why do they grow bigger? And it's a very interesting question you ask. And there's, there's some interesting history there. Because uh, after farmer, most of the antibiotics that are used, for example, in the United States or China, and until recently in Europe, are used on the farm for this purpose of growth promotion. And there was a lot of unhappiness about this because we're, we're wasting our antibiotics on the farm animals and we're getting antibiotic resistance. And so agriculture stopped studying this because uh, they, didn't, they just wanted to keep using it and, and not study it further. There was some evidence that uh, some certain hormones related to growth were changed, something called insulin-like growth factor were changed. There's some evidence now from the mouse studies that 
the antibiotics select for a, a microbiota that's more energy efficient, that it's creating more energy. Some of it goes to the microbes and some of it goes to the animals at a critical early per portion of life. That The age part is very important. Thank you for the presentations. Um, I wanted to ask a question about uh, cancer and microbiome. So you mentioned that uh, breast cancer patients have similar microbiome, and I wanted to ask if uh, they already had a similar microbiome before the disease, or did cancer affected their microbiome and that it developed in a specific pattern? So you're asking about cause and effect, right? Um, whether or not their microbiome was altered, and then, you know, what do you think? Marty, Marty's a doctor, so what do you think, Marty? Uh, there, there is, this is a very new area of science, but there's, as Margaret said, there is evidence in many different kinds of tumors that not only is there a gut microbiome, but there is a population of microbes in the tumor itself. And um, and what is interesting, work that Rob Knight has done, who, who Margaret has mentioned, is that if you take a blood if you take a blood specimen from any of us, and you uh, purify the DNA, uh, let's say ninety nine percent of that will be human DNA, but about one percent will be microbial DNA in all of us, and there's increasing evidence that the DNA that you find in people who have cancer, the pattern is different than the pattern you find in normal people, and it is tumor specific. So this is, this is a very current area of research, and it suggests that one day we may be able to harness the information about microbes to better earlier diagnose cancers, to tell what kind of cancers they are, and there, there seem to be some particular characteristics of the pattern that might tell us something about prognosis. Yeah, when, when I um, went to the National Cancer Institute, it was just before COVID hit. In other words, it was that recently that, it was that recent that, they, that the National Cancer Institute was feeling like they wanted to try to understand why this is happening and how it's happening. Um, it's, it's a really active area of research, as Marty said. Not well understood, I think. But maybe, so in terms of cause and consequence, um, it, as Marty said, it's, it's still very, very recent and, uh, and it's not very clear, but for example, in colon cancer, would you say that there's, that there's more data um, proving cause or? There, there, has, there have been several different microbes that have been associated with colon cancer, microbes that many people have, but maybe higher concentrations in people who have colon cancer. That's, again, a question of cause or effect. Do they have higher concentrations because they have the cancer or not? There are studies that are ongoing looking at people with precancerous lesions to try to answer that question. Thank you very much for these talks. They were really, really interesting. I was just wondering, and from a public perspective, if you were to give guidance to um, your, say, daughter who's going to have a baby, would you recommend a C-section or not, given the, you know, the different impacts that that, uh, you know, lack of transfer uh, on on microbiota might imply? Maybe I can answer that because my wife, uh, Maria Gloria Dominguez, has been studying this for the last 15 years and, and has a, a lot of data on this. The, the first thing to say is that if you look at rates of C-sections in different countries, there's a lot of variation, even in Europe. And so, for example, the lowest rate of C-section in Europe is in Sweden or Netherlands. It's about 10% of births, 10 to 13% of births. In, in other countries, uh, in the United States, the rate of C-section is 32%. And in some countries, it's 50%. Uh, 
I don't know what the rate here is in Portugal, but I, I, I know that it's higher than in Scandinavia. And so the question is, why is there so much variation? And in Italy, for example, the rate of C-sections in Rome is about 80%, and in the rest of Italy, it's about 40%. And I don't think that the pelvises are that different in Rome and elsewhere. This has, again, this has to do with the practice of medicine. Uh, and in many South American countries, the rates are over 50%. So th the medical establishment in some places has gotten very invested in doing C-sections. Women are interested in C-sections because of the low pain involved and the convenience. Uh, and it's great for everybody, but it may not be great for the baby uh, because it, the microbiome in the baby born by C-section is different than before. And so uh, I, I think the question is, if, if a C-section is medically necessary, it should be done. But the, the patient should ask the doctor, are you sure that a C-section is necessary? Because it seems to be a slippery slope. Same apply, the same applies to antibiotic usage, right? The same applies to antibiotic usage. We see in medicine that there are fads in, 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 in medical practice. That's why this, the, I show the graph about the variation in antibiotic doses. It cannot be explained by difference in rates of serious infection. It reflects differences in practice. Okay, so while we wait for other questions, <laughs> there's, there's one there, yeah. Um, I have a question about uh, drugs and microbiome. So you mentioned that different drugs affects people differently because we have different microbiomes. And do you think that in the future it will, it would make sense to test the microbiome before getting drugs prescribed? Or do you think it will happen in the future? Yeah, I can maybe start, start with answering that question. So the question is whether we should um, consider the microbiome for the choice and of drug and maybe the dosage. I, I think that is indeed um, a, a route for the future. I think it's important to realize that it's not for each drug this is indicated. Similar as, as um, today's practice, not for, um, for each drug that we take, we would analyze the human genome to find the best drug or, or to get an indication which dose we would, we would first prescribe. Um, but there are cases where people typically take drugs for a long time um, and which are hard to uh, actually adjust the right dose. And these might be cases if the microbiome plays a role in the variation where we could indeed first analyze the microbiota, um, get suggestions from what we see from the microbial signature to then adjust the dose or even potentially change the drugs if we do have an alternative. I think one point that is really interesting about the microbiota is that it can be changed. Um, so we, Martin actually pointed that out at the end of, 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 of the talk, that there are ways to actually modulate um, the microbiota. And so if a patient really needs a drug, but is not his, his or her microbiota is not compatible um, with, the micro, uh, with that drug, there are ways that we could modify um, the patient's microbiota to be compatible and to, to actually uh, profit from, benefit from that drug. Thank you. And do you think drugs like um, birth control pills somehow affect the microbiota? That's a good question, um, which um, I think in general, we do see that steroids are metabolized um, by, by uh, gut microbes. Um, if I remember the data correctly, that's the first heat map that I showed. I, I think they're not the strongest inhibitor of the microbes that were, um, um, that were tested. And um, I'm not aware of, um, of studies that have looked in population, but maybe Marty, you, you know of studies where people with and without birth control have been looked at for shifts in the microbiota. I think the, under, <coughs> the underlying point is that the, the, the drugs in the birth control pills are food for microbes. There are some microbes that can, that can eat these and utilize them for energy. And going back to the earliest days of birth control, 
uh, there have been interactions. Interestingly, in the early days when some women took antibiotics, uh, they, they had bleeding because the, the uh, pills didn't work very well, and that is because of an effect on the microbiome. So th there's definitely an interaction with these steroids, but as Michael says, there, there probably is a lot of variation from woman to woman. Also, I think um, I'd love to have Marty um, mention that the, the microbiota has a profound effect on the food you eat. And I, I was hearing about um, a study that was done with children with whole milk and in skim milk. I don't know if you know heard about that I'm one. I'm familiar with that. Yeah, and so um, they gave a cohort of children whole milk and skim milk, and the ones who gained weight were the ones who had skim milk, <laughs> and it had to do with the fact that they had taken out all the fat, and it was still very sweet and not not and yet not very satiating. So they would drink more of it. And so they had a tendency to gain weight. So we think that, you know, and there's also been an issue of us in, in fat, not wanting to have fat. And I think our microbiome um, has a pretty good effect on, on, on that. And, and sugars are probably, carbohydrates are probably a lot worse. Yeah. I have another question. Um, so do you think that uh, microbiome affects personality? And if yes, you said that in the future, for example, if we need specific drugs, we can manipulate our microbiome. But uh, should we think about um, the potential that our personality could change? <laughs> well, that's a tough one, <laughs> but, a, but, but a very interesting one. Um, Definitely, there there is um, people have um, developed a lot of interest in the microbiota and microbial products such as metabolites, which are small molecules that the microbes produce, and signaling to the brain. Um, people um, people name that the the gut brain axis, and so there seem to be a, a, a very strong axis and the microbiota and the microbiota uh, composition can influence, uh, influence um, the brain and behavior. Margaret just mentioned that the microbiota can also influence what we like to eat. Um, how this, of course, if there is a change, this can actually change um, the effects it has on, on the brain, if that answers the question. Uh, I, actually, we, we are all teaching in, in a course about uh, symbiosis uh, at, at the Institute Gulbenkian in Uwarish. And this afternoon, one of the students presented a paper that just appeared in which um, the investigators uh, compared the effects of microbiome on food preferences. The way they did the experiment is that they took three different species of mice that had different food preferences. And they took their microbiome and they gave them to germ-free mice, mice in a bubble, so that they gave them microbiota one, two, or three, and then they saw what, the micro, what food the, the mice ate. And the microbiome transferred the preference for food that the original mice had. Hello, good afternoon. I would like to know what is the role or relationship of the microbiome with the neurological diseases, such as ADHD and autoimmune diseases? You know, I'll just begin to answer that. And th there's a lot of interest in that question. There are people all over the world who are studying the, these questions. Uh, they are studying it in populations uh, of children, and they're studying them in experimental models, uh, such as we're, we're doing in mice. And there is a suggestion that there is some involvement, but it is not, it's not definitive yet. There, there has to be uh, much more work, but many people are active in this field. And maybe just to, to, to answer on the, on the immune side, um, you, you, you have to imagine, and, and 
um, Martin actually showed that nicely with birds, where we are actually, that's where we start colonizing um, um, our, our body with microbes. So we start, we start kind of as an empty, empty body, kind of germ-free um, before birth, and then we get colonized. And um, so, so the bacteria that colonize that, us and that we start assembling in the course of life, they have a huge effect on the training of our immune system. So it's actually uh, very clear that the immune system that has seen microbes is a different one than the one that hasn't seen. Hence, there, there's obvious links uh, to, to also autoimmune diseases and diseases that um, involve um, the immune system. Also, by the way, uh, cancer that we discussed as the very first question that um, where the immune system plays an important role to suppress cancer, that there, that's another link that people have made uh, between the microbiota and, and the development of, of tumors. There's one uh, still here in the middle and then... Uh, oh, okay. I, I, hello. I would like to ask if the same way that we see some, some phylas like the firmicutes being selected out or promoted, so these microorganisms consource here working together, if we see the same pattern regarding metabolites, so are there any metabolites being preferentially generated? And I'm most interested in sulfur and sulfide-related metabolites. Maybe Michael? You, so, so, so you're asking specifically after um, after a perturbation, a kind of a shift from kind of towards firmicutes, and whether this is reflected? Or? No, I was just asking yeah. Yeah, if I, the I, same I, way that we see some phyla taking out yeah. or taking over some yeah. of the other phyla that are present, if we see the same pattern regarding yeah. metabolites, yeah. There if there are yeah. some so, small so, molecules yeah. that are sure. selected out, let's say. So there are some molecules that are in human blood or human urine that are specifically of microbial origin. They, they only come from microbes. One of those is a drug is a molecule called indoxyl sulfate. It's a sulfated molecule. It's a molecule that has long been known as a nephrotoxin. It 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 it, it accumulates in people with kidney failure and has been shown to be um, injurious to the kidneys. That, that's a molecule that's specifically of microbial origin. And so investigators are, are looking at ways that they can modulate levels of endoxyl sulfate to uh, improve the situation in people with kidney disease. That's one example. I think we can take these two more questions. Um, there, there was one here in the middle. Thank, thank you very much for your talks. I would like to ask you, how do you think that citizens can help scientists to preserve our microbiomes and can help themselves also to preserve them? Margaret, you want to? So, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, one of the things that, that I've noticed is that, um, that, that in general, the population is very well aware and very, very interested. Um, in, in this because it is, does seem to be connected if you, you know, read the newspaper or, or online or whatever. It is connected to a lot of different diseases and that's coming to light into the popular press. And I know that when I get on an airplane, if I, the person next to me says, what do you do? And I say, well, I, I work on the role of beneficial bacteria in health. Oh my God, I should never say that because then I'm talking to this person for the next two hours. <laughs> Because it's a very, um, it's something that, that I think the general public is becoming very aware. And I think that, um, I think that, you know, what Marty does is, you know, getting the word out that if you've got a viral infection, don't be taking antibiotics. <laughs> you know, and in other words, you know, be really, as the, the public should be really careful in thinking about that sort of thing. And, and I think, you know, I, I would suggest that, that people um, sort of keep an eye on this because it's really a new field, but I think it's going to be very important. And there's a lot of correlations with, you know, when people were asking about the brain, 
you know, the gut-brain axis is a huge area of study. And there's some suggestion that it's involved in Parkinson's. If, tell me if I'm wrong, Marty. Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and um, MS and various things like that. And so, you know, I, the person who asked about the baby <laughs> microbiome and whether or not um, they would have a C-section. So it's not just C-section, but you know, if, if you have a baby, you wanna be sure you breastfeed that baby. I, I wanna make one other comment, and that is that uh, recently a group of scientists in, um, in Belgium uh, wanted to study the microbiome uh, of the vagina. And uh, they did a citizen science project. They, um, they had hoped that they would enroll 200 women in this study, and their IRB told them that it would be very unlikely that they would get 200 women to agree to sample themselves and give information. In fact, uh, they got 6,000 women to do this, and I think there are going to be more and more citizen science exactly. studies of the microbiome. Thank you. Uh, I was just thinking about citizen science projects, and I think they can be really important for this subject. Thank you. Maybe one last question. Just a curiosity, going back to the C-section, could it be a good practical advice to scrub a baby a C-section baby with the secretions of uh, the mother. I heard once uh, on a research paper, I think I read, uh, or article in a newspaper, that there were doctors doing this in Germany, and there was a huge problem. But scientifically, it would make sense or not. Yeah, well, I, I'm very biased, because the, the person who developed that technique is my wife, uh, M Maria Gloria Dominguez. And she did some of the early studies showing that babies born by C-section are different than babies born naturally. And then the question was, could you restore the normal microbiota? And, and she and colleagues have done such studies, and they have shown that you can at least partially restore. And that has been called vaginal seeding. And, and some doctors are doing it, not many, but some doctors are doing it. Women all over the world are doing it because it actually makes sense. Um, and this, uh, this is likely to become a, a more common practice in the future. Maybe I'll just add that uh, as we've been discussing in the summer course, uh, doctors have been, um, it's, it's a change in, in rationale and paradigm, right? Doctors have been worried about uh, protecting us from, from what we call pathogens, from infections, right? And so uh, it, there's, for them, it's also a shift in the, in the practicing. And, and, uh, and uh, I think, I guess, maybe we can uh, predict a bit here the future, but so we need to be able to continue to rely on the, on the antibiotics when we need them. But um, I think then I'll ask you too you know, complement what you were saying yesterday about what we think can be the future, right? So maybe still give antibiotics, but we need to restart, and yeah. yeah. So antibiotics are miraculous drugs. They're very important drugs for people who have serious infections. There's nothing better. But most people who, have, who get antibiotics don't have serious infections, so we have to use them less, and there will be more and more interest in, in restoration. One of the ideas is that parents will stay, save their baby's poop, and if they have to get an antibiotic, give them their poop back. That, that, that may be in the future. Yeah, that's actually you know, very efficacious, apparently, for people who get a Clostridium difficile infection in the hospital. Um, it turns out it's over 90% um, recovery. People will get severely um, sick from C. diff, and then you, it, almost miraculously within a day, if you transplant back, um, you, you, the person is, is it, it's, it's amazing. Um, I happened to be back at the National Academy and the FDA was having a big panel because, on this because they're very worried about it. And it works extremely well, and so the doctors are, are you know, they're, they're um, worried about it, but at the same time, if they don't do it, um, there's a possibility that the 
patient will die. So it's, it's, it's a new day. It's, and so I, I think that that is the big message that I hope to get across when I was talking and then these guys talking very specifically about how this affects medicine. This is a new day. This is a new day for us to understand um, humans, for us to understand plants, for us to understand soil and water and begin to integrate into our ideas the, the microbial world. This is probably a good way to finish, no? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. And <laughs> and if you uh, pay attention to our SimNet initiatives, then we hope to continue some of these um, workshops in, in, in the next coming year here at the Gulbenkian. Okay.